Welcome everybody to our conversations in environmental communication series here at the University of Washington's program on the environment. Um, I'm, my name is Sean McDonald and I'm your host for this evening. We've had a fantastic guest with us today, Johnny Armstrong, he's an assistant professor at OSU, Oregon State University, here to talk about his work in conservation photography and remote camera trapping. Um, before I go on uh, talking about Johnny, I'd like to start uh, with our land acknowledgement at the University of Washington. So the University of Washington acknowledges the Coast Salish people of this land, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. While we meet today on a virtual platform, I'd like to encourage us all to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands in which we each call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility to improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local indigenous peoples and their cultures. So uh, for those of you who have joined us before, you know the drill, but uh, if you're new, welcome. Our, our guests will start with a 30 minute presentation or roughly 30 minute presentation before we uh, jump into an audience driven Q and A. Folks on the Zoom can feel free to enter their questions within the chat or raise their little digital hands and uh, We'll make sure to uh, call upon you. If you are joining us on YouTube, you can type your questions into the chat on YouTube and we'll make sure we read those to our speaker. And if you're joining us from YouTube or you want to join us from YouTube, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking the little bell icon and then you'll receive notifications for our upcoming live streams. All right. so. It is my extreme pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Johnny Armstrong. As I said, he's an assistant professor at Oregon State University uh, and a, a, uh, an amazing uh, wildlife photographer. Uh, Johnny Armstrong got his PhD at the University of Washington in the School of Aquatic and Fishery Sciences, working with the Alaska Salmon Program. Uh, during his time in the field, he spent a lot of that uh, taking pictures for fun and fiddling with electronics for his research. This led him to explore remote photography, where motion sensors trigger cameras to photograph wildlife. Ever since, he's been trying and usually failing, and, but occasionally succeeding, at capturing intimate portraits of elusive critters. Uh, he's now a professor at Oregon State University, and most weekends he can be found setting up camera traps with his kids, uh, he uses, he uses uh, photography to communicate science and to engage the public in conservation. And full disclosure, as I've already shared online, um, I went to grad school with Johnny and I have seen the progression of his photography. Uh, he, was a, he was an amazing photographer to begin with, and uh, he is a truly an amazing photographer now. It's, a, it's amazing the, the stuff that he has been producing. Uh, additionally, He's uh, an amazing scientist and a pretty cool guy too. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Johnny and let's give him a round of applause. Oh, thanks. All right, so thank, thanks so much for that very kind intro and I'm, I'm super thrilled to be here. I'm lonely in all this isolation, so it's really fun to just get to interact with folks and, and uh, talk. Okay, so y'all can hear me, right? Just give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Yep. I'm getting a weird message, okay. Ignore that little thing. I'm going to share my screen. Right. All right. So um, I thought I would just, um, my title slide, I had to be honest to my ratio of successes to failures. So I have a photo here of a bobcat that I got locally, but also I have an um, acrobatic ground squirrel that decided to hang out on my lens, uh, curious cows. And then uh, a time when my camera trap got knocked over and the lens of my uh, camera perfectly landed on a rock. And so today I'm going to be talking about camera trapping and conservation photography. But if I can give my full disclosure, just like Pishon did, you know, I'm a, I'm a professor and a researcher, but I don't, I'm not an authority on, um, on, on the use of images in photography, you know, and, and sort of like the, the field of conservation. So I'm going to share this. My lecture or seminar is going to be largely just talking about um, adventures in camera trapping and, and how I think um, camera trap images can advance conservation and, and kind of change our relationship uh, with nature sometimes. And so, um, 
can my slides do that? Okay, so real quickly, I was talking to Daniel Schindler, my, my former PhD advisor. We're working on a project, and a couple days ago, I talked to him about a figure, and he said, oh, you're giving a seminar on, on the importance of uh, conservation photography. I was like, it's a seminar? I thought I was just talking to a class. I thought I was just going to tell stories about camera chopping. He's like, no, no, you need to start out with like a profound statement about, about you know, like the um, history of, of photography and conservation. And so I kind of got this like nervous feeling in my stomach. But see, I'm an academic, so I, I thought I'm a researcher. So the way I dealt with this, I went to Google Scholar and I typed in, you know, pho photography and conservation. And I found a study. And it turned out it was, a, it was by authors, it was led by Gabby Salazar, but also included an author who's a friend of mine, Diogo. And so here they actually did an experiment where they did all these different posters at a museum and then had a donation box under them. And some of them had wildlife and some of them had children. And this one had this creepy picture with all these staring eyes. And so I thought for sure this study would be a perfect way for me to show how important images are for conservation. But then you can imagine I was completely gutted when I found that images didn't even have statistical significance. And this creepy eye photo did just as well as the dolphins. But I'm gonna push back on this just a little bit. So, okay, maybe in this like narrow context of, of a, you know, the first experimental work ever done, you don't find significance. But maybe if we just think about it more intuitively or just the world around us, I think you can make a good case for why photographs matter now more than ever. And so I would start with this picture. This is what the world looks like around us so often right now, right? People staring at their phones. And I'm, I'm guilty of this too. I get the little iPhone reminder of my screen time and I'm just deeply ashamed. Just, I think, you know, anytime I, I claim that I'm busy and then I see that I spend three hours on my phone every week, it's, anyways. So I imagine that, that some of y'all do too. And so much of the time that we spend on our phone, we're looking at pictures. You know, I bet a lot of these people, these are probably just paid, paid actors for a stock photo, but in real life, they'd, a lot of them would be looking at, at photos. And, you know, things I sometimes make fun of because I'm, I'm an old user now, I don't understand. I'm like, uh, TikTok. But, you know, these social media applications are, incre you know, they are centered around uh, using images often and, and, and things like social media are evolving. We're using, people are using uh, images in different ways constantly to tell stories. So I would argue that at no time, and I'm a fish biologist, I can't, probably shouldn't make these statements, but I'm going to say at no time in human history have humans looked at so many images before and have they been such a central part of storytelling. And you know, when I was trained in uh, science communication, it was in a graduate class that I took at UW. And I learned about the, the compass message box. And when I, when now, you know, when I am going to do press on a on a paper or something like that, and I'm thinking about, hey, how am I going to convey the problem? How am I going to introduce the issue? How am I going to convey its significance? I find it's really difficult to do this with just words alone. And there's this really strong synergy between words and images, and they can. And, and uh, I, you know, the cliche, like a photo is worth a thousand words. I think it, it really often is true. And, and it's beyond the scope of this seminar today to try to, you know, show you all the cool ways in which photos can engage audiences. So I just did kind of a superficial tour between folks I know or things I found on the internet. And, you know, here's some images that the top two are, are images that found creative ways to capture, um, you know, problems, uh, conservation problems in marine ecosystems. Here's a picture that was of a commercial fishing net breaking and, and scattering dead fish everywhere that was used to, to represent overfishing. Um, and uh, I'm sure if Ray's in the audience, he's going to tell me this is sustainable. So maybe, maybe it is a sustainable fishery if Ray Hillborn's here. Um, and uh, this is a, you know, how do you convey coral reef bleaching in a way that's novel and still grips people? Well, here's a picture of, um, of you know, a photo underwater showing the before and after. And then, you know, I'm a freshwater ecologist. And one of the things that we struggle with is, is finding ways to, to share fish species with the world that no one knows about, because it's, it's pretty hard to get pictures of fish in their environment. But folks like um, Jeremy Monroe and, and David, I, I know David very well, but I still can't pronounce his last name, at Freshwaters Illustrated, they're doing really cool work sharing um, pictures of, of freshwater fish that you probably never knew existed. And Jason Shane, who's at University of Washington, works with the Alaska Salmon Program, has done phenomenal work. This is um, a picture, uh, he was working on a project with me, and this is a picture he got that's one of the only 
sort of high quality intimate portraits of the endemic sucker species that live in the Klamath Basin that are on the verge of extinction. Um, so photos can introduce an issue or they can help us connect with animals in a way that make us care more and realize potentially what's at stake if these, if these species are going to go extinct. Okay, so that's my attempt to establish the importance of images and conservation. Now I want to talk more just about my own journey in um, photography and, and how I stumbled across camera trap photography and, went, and I've been on kind of a 10 year rabbit hole just going deeper and deeper down the hole and getting more interested in, in this um, in this hobby and, and how it kind of relates to my uh, science and, and, uh, and communication science. So here's a, here's a picture that I did not take with the camera trap. This is how I photographed wildlife before 2011, the critical year when I got into camera trapping. And, and this, is, this is a pretty picture of a fox. Um, and I took it with a telephoto lens. This is like the traditional way that we do nature photography. And, and, and nature, you know, these traditional techniques, they they're create really aesthetically pleasing images because they compress the background of the subject. They give you this beautiful out of focus background and create these, these um, you know, really nice portraits. And also, this traditional way that we do nature photography with longer lenses, it can be an incredibly enjoyable way to spend time outdoors. Um, anyone in the audience who's ever done this probably knows it's really fun to watch animals through a long lens. It's just like watching through binoculars, but then you get to like harvest these fleeting moments and hold on to them and, and you know, create art with them. It's, it's, it's a really wonderful way to interact with um, the world around you. But there are some limitations, and this is what led me to camera tracking. So the first, here's a totally typical scene if you go to a national park, right? A bunch of old dudes, um, retired guys with giant lenses. Um, and I just Googled the price of like an 800 millimeter or 600 millimeter lens, $13,000. Can you believe that? Just for the lens. And, and it's not like, this is different than like a Lamborghini being an expensive car because you actually, these are not, these lenses are extravagant in how much they cost, but they're actually completely functional and you do, you know, potentially need lenses this long to fill the frame with an elusive critter like a wolf in Yellowstone. So, you know, traditional techniques are expensive and they, they restrict you to this narrow swath of the incredible diverse, um, uh, diversity of techniques that are available in photography, like all the other lengths of uh, lenses and the perspectives they provide, like a wide angle lens, um, and also things like lighting, which are an entire kind of field to themselves. And, and this is what's the most important limitation of traditional photography, is that, you know, especially around the place where we live, um, most of like, you know, some of the cool species like carnivores, they become nocturnal. There's really cool research showing this, and many of them are naturally nocturnal. And you can't really take nocturnal pictures with a big lens like this that can't gather light and without using lighting. So really, if you're, if you're, if you're only gonna photograph the world this way, Instantly, so much of the biodiversity out there is sort of off limits to you. So, you know, so th these are the constraints that led me to camera trapping. And you can now frequently find me like out and maybe not frequently because I got a you know, this job and the kids and everything, but find me out, you know, um, setting up a camera at dusk in some random spot where I found animal sign. Like here's where I found a fresh cougar scrape. And um, that's when they, like a cat in a litter box, you know, they scratch their foot and leave this little like uh, track. So I found one here. Um, and so camera trapping is a great way to overcome those limitations, unlock all the tools of photography and allow you to get uh, pictures of species um, that you never even knew existed and, and ones that don't come out in the daytime. So how I'm gonna briefly describe my journey of how I discovered camera trapping and found my way to the hobby and it started with torturing all my friends and family's pets. So this is my in-laws dog, Chilko. And I started to get into using lighting and portraits. And for some reason that like the kind of creative process of adding light to a scene really um, just fascinated me. I found it incredibly um, fun and rewarding, but I had no interest in taking pictures of people, partly because they're really impatient and partly because, you know, it just didn't, didn't appeal to me. But I wanted to take pictures of animals. So I'd photograph my friend's dogs, chickens, goats, cats. Um, but at some point, you know, I realized, well my, well, my real passion is wildlife. And I would love to take this style of picture 
with a wider lens that gives you the perspective of an animal of an animal in the context of its environment. I want that perspective and I want the creative possibilities of adding your own light, but I want to do it with wild animals. And I thought, how can I do this? And um, so, you know, I, I knew that that camera traps existed. We had trail cameras in the in the research camp. That was when trail cameras were kind of first coming out. But we had some in the in the in the Alaska pro program, salmon program, research camps. And I thought, um, oh, I think is there a chat here? I'm gonna check real quick. I see a little bubble. Where was this photo taken? Is that the one of the? Um, if it's the one of the dog that was in Montana, and if it's me uh, posing with my hat tucked to the back so I get light on my face, that's in the Siskiyou Mountains. Okay, so, so I thought, I need to build a camera trap. But in 2011, there weren't really commercially available camera traps. There was, it wasn't like there was a blog um, of someone telling you how to do camera trapping, and, and very few folks were, were doing it in terms of, of using camera traps to actually get like artistic photos and not just like trail cams for hunting or research. So, um, but where you could find a lot of information was this really kind of interesting hobby kind of online community, which is where folks use these microcontroller boards and hook up sensors and get them to control things. So do things like, you know, come up with a homemade system to turn on, turn on and off your sprinklers or make a little robot that walks around in the room. So really quickly you can find, you can just Google and figure out how to control your camera with sensors. And that's really what we do in camera trapping is we take an object detection sensor. This is a PIR sensor. Then we hook it up with wires to like a, a microcontroller, and then that controls your camera. So it's wild. Like you could, so th this kind of dates me because this is when you could get the stuff at Radio Shack, which is, you know, if anyone in the audience is drinking right now, you can pour out some liquor for Radio Shack. They're no longer there. Um, but you can order the stuff online and you can go, you know, search, you know, like a robot forum and really quickly find like a tutorial for how to do this. But while that was easy, Getting this to work, not just on your desk at home, but out in the wild and getting the things to, to um, not run out of batteries within a couple of hours, that was really hard. So it actually took like a couple of months. Jason, Shane, and I were up in the field camps in Alaska and, and we would set this up and it'd be dead in half an hour. We'd figure out the part that was dying, fix that. Um, then something else would die. We went through this for a while, but we finally got um, started to get pictures. And here's the, the next picture is the first picture I ever got on a camera trap. It's a stunningly captivating image. One of the best wildlife pictures ever taken, probably. So I'm, I'm definitely joking. It's not even remotely in focus. This was a picture of a bear next to a stream. The stream was littered with salmon carcasses. So we took one of them and like threw it up on the bank, put the camera down, and like the, the focus ring slipped and this bear came and I got this crappy picture of a bear. But this was a huge victory. This was because it, I showed up and the camera was still working. And, and, and so it kind of opened a major door. So the next night, we did the same thing again, but we set the camera a little better. We put another, uh, uh, you know, we scoot another salmon carcass 10 feet over into this area where it was safer to leave the camera. And we got this picture. And, and we were all crowded around the laptop. You know, we downloaded the memory card. And we had this picture of a bull moose looking right back at us. And everybody just lost it. We were kind of laughing hysterically. Um, and this is when I think I really caught the passion and realized how much fun camera trapping could be because it's such a crazy surprise. And like, why, why is this moose like sniffing a sound? I, I don't know why, but the other cool thing is that, so with a long lens, right, you get the perspective like you're looking at an animal through binoculars or a telescope. But when you look at this picture, it's almost like jarring for a sec because it, it is from the perspective as if it was right in front of you. This is what it would look like if you saw a moose with your eyes from, from like a few feet away. So it has that kind of intimate or almost like, you know, with a, with a, I'm not as scared of, of, a, um, of a male moose, but if it was a cow moose with a calf, I'd be freaked out. Um, so, then, so then I started to get a little more confident here. And then, so the next camera trap set we did, we found a narrow gravel bar within a stream that had a sockeye salmon in it. And I put my camera just in like this gravel bar that was just like an inch out of the water and there was, there was dead salmon around. There was one right there. We scooted it maybe like in front of the lens, like a foot in front of the lens. And I didn't have any, I didn't have any lighting. I didn't have any gear back there for like, you know, like light stands and stuff like that. So I got a bright orange Home Depot bucket and I duct taped my little waterproof flash 
on it and put it like 20 feet off in the bushes. And then I got this picture of a bear coming in to eat the salmon. I got it within like a few hours. Um, and it ate the salmon, just walked up, or grabbed the salmon, just kept walking up the stream. And um, I got a question in, in the back, and it said, um, depth of field is a powerful tool when applied so that you can get behavior of animal unaffected by your presence. Yeah, depth of field is a, is a powerful tool, agree. Um, so, so I was really psyched on this picture, and then, I, and then one thing that's kind of cool, this is like the, this is you know, very early on in my, in my adventures of camera trapping, but I still use this image to this day as a, as for science communication. So, um, you know, not too long, a couple of years after I got this photo, uh, High Country News did a piece on the Alaska Salmon Program, at, and it kind of centrally featured Daniel Schindler and some of the some of the, some of the work. And and this picture was kind of used up front in that article. This is not as, as exciting, but it's been used on like the covers of, of journals that we published in. And th this one I thought was really cool. Recently, a postdoc at my lab, we published a paper on salmon bear interactions, and Ed Young covered it for the Atlantic, and we used this photo as the, um, you know, as the kind of like the, um, the photo to go with the article. So these older photos are still kind of helping me communicate science. Um, oh, wait, did I forget? Was that number two? Oh, yeah, okay, so um, now I remember why I have a picture of Liam Neeson up here. So. The, thing, the funny thing about as I've gone on with camera trapping is that just like Liam Neeson in the award, didn't it win Best Picture, the award-winning movie Taken? Just critically acclaimed, uh, wonderful film. I'm just joking. Um, I have a very particular set of skills. And the problem is pop culture reference, I forget how old I am. And so like mo most students probably haven't seen Taken. Um, but he says on the phone that he has a very particular set of skills. And, and I actually do have a, from camera trapping, you get the craziest combination of skills. Um, so here's the three different kind of like communities that you tap knowledge from that are like the, the least likely people to interact on the planet. So one, the kind of, you know, fiddling with robots and electronics, like there's that kind of hobby. Then there's um, studio lighting or even cinematic lighting where you're trying to light a whole scene. And then there's fur trapping where people use like the anal glands of animals to create scent lures or like spray red fox urine around to cover their scent. And so, you know, if you put all these people in a room together, they, they'd probably, you know, be like, oh my gosh, we had nothing in common. But as a, as a camera trapper, you're having to deal with, you're having to light scenes, which is a really, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a discipline unto itself. You're having to fiddle with electronics and like solder wires to, to um, tiny boards. And then with the trapping stuff, really it is fundamentally the exact same thing as fur trapping, but kind of like catch and release, or not even catching them. It's, of course, much less um, invasive, hopefully. And, um, but I do want to share a quick anecdote, which is I was having so much. Oh, yeah, I see a comment about gusto. That gusto is anyone who's a small, uh, who's like a small male biologist knows that this is a similar called gusto that is, if, if you're like, in the lexicon of like of of, uh, of wildlife biology, call it loud. It's a very loud scent. It's insane. Like it, it you could smell it from like outside your house if you had it uh, in someone's car. In, anyways, incredible prank material. I haven't ever used it, but you could pull some incredible pranks with this stuff. I, I'm gonna run out of time just talking about uh, scent lures, but I did want to share that I was so frustrated um, trying to photograph coyotes, which are basically impossible to. To trap to take pictures of with a fancy camera trap because they're so smart after being persecuted by humans for so long. But I was so frustrated, and I, I started searching the internet for like how to how to um, trap coyotes. Um, and so I, someone said that you spray red fox urine to cover your human scent. So I, I actually bought a bottle of red fox urine. Um, my partner at the time was not impressed, and um, and I sprayed it. First I would just spray it wherever I walked. But that wasn't working. I still wasn't getting pictures of photos. So then I said, you know what? Forget this. I'm going for it. So I sprayed the red fox urine all over all my camera gear, like all over the pelican cases and everything. And to this date, I still haven't gotten any good pictures of the coyotes. But now a bunch of my stuff does smell like fox urine, or it did for a while. So it totally didn't work. Um, okay, so, um, so now we kind of established, you know, the process of camera trapping, um, how you probably shouldn't bother with using... Uh, Fox you're in. So I want to share one of my favorite things about camera trapping is it allows you to kind of be ideas or concept driven. And what I mean by that is 
um, instead of kind of being reacting to a scene, you know, like, oh, an animal popped out. Um, I'm going to grab, I'm going to grab a, uh, my camera and like, hope I can get an image before it's gone. You know, um, instead you actually have the potential to like dream up these crazy images and then set, you know, set up a scene with lights and the, and the background that you want and try to pull that image off. And I'm not to say that, you know, photographers using other techniques aren't really creative and everything, but there is, I think, a unique potential to kind of be, you know, you're sitting there not paying attention when you probably should be, and this idea pops into your head, and then that can turn into a photo. So for me, one of these was trying to think about how to get a picture of a grizzly bear when they're using a rub tree. And I'm not sure if they, if they, if, if we're sure about why they use these trees, if it's for communication with other bears or just to scratch their back, but bears will rub their back on trees. So if you're from the woods walking around and you see a, a tree that looks chewed up, go check it out and see if you see any uh, fur on it. It might be a, a black bear or a brown bear rub tree. But um, before I went to the field one summer, Daniel was telling me about, Daniel Schindler was telling me about how he'd seen some trees with bear fur on them. He found some good rub trees. So when I got up there, we decided to set a camera trap on one and I wanted to get a unique perspective. So I thought we should do it, um, a bird's eye view up in the tree. And this again was still early before I had any cool gadgets for mounting gear. But luckily there was lots of gorilla tape in the, in the Camp Nurka up in Alaska. And Daniel is really good at, at, um, at duct tape skills. So I don't even think we had this ladder when we set it up. I think he got on my shoulders and we found like a camera, we found a, like a video tripod from the seventies that was broken. And we like just duct taped it up in the up way up in this tree and set my camera trap. It really seemed like it, it wasn't going to work. And then got this cool photo of a, um, of a bear coming in and this bear came in and like rubbed all over the tree. And then it actually stood up and like kind of reached half out of the top of the frame and chomped the tree. I think they do that to communicate to the other bears how tall they are. It's like an honest signal of body size. But so this is really exciting. And I think at the time it was, it was at the time I think it may have been the first bird's eye shot of a bear rubbing on a tree. However, since then I've seen this like in some of the, I think it was maybe Planet Earth 2 or one of the recent really cool nature documentaries that had a, a, a camera trap video uh, of a bear doing this. Um, Someone said he looks really offended that you invaded his private tree rubbing time. But you could, I think that might be projecting um, negative emotions onto the bear because it did keep on rubbing the tree and bit the top of it. So it didn't, it didn't seem like it was spooked, but, but it's possible. I can't know what this bear was thinking. Plus this, I think this was a really big pair, bear, like it was a dominant male. So maybe it was just like pumped with, uh, I assume bears have like test the dominant males like bumping with, testosterone, you know, this does look kind of like it might have been an angry bear. So, and then I, I tried this shot again. I don't like this photo as much, but I tried it again in Corvallis um, a couple years ago and got a picture of a mountain lion. So the next one that I want to talk about um, was the light panel. This was a crazy idea that I had in, in 2012 where I wanted to get soft light uh, on animals. And so soft light, I don't, I'm not, so it, you know, right now, I noticed that folks um, have stunning uh, production quality in their, in their Zoom camera, you know, in their webcam. And I think that I know some folks are using ring lights. I need to get a ring light for myself. Um, but basically, you know, these are like modifiers that make much more flattering, really beautiful, soft, like painterly like light. But the trick is you don't just need to diffuse the, the, the light source, but you need to make the light source large relative to the size of your subject. That means you get a, have to have an insanely big light source to make a big animal have that beautiful soft light. So I did this by uh, working with my lab mates um, to make this this like uh, we took old lumber and made this square and then put ripstop nylon on, on it and then we hid it up in a tree and put a flash behind it so it would create this like soft light source. I didn't think this was ever going to work, um, but it was. The way, like, its trajectory relative to this game trail made it so animals couldn't really see it and it was hidden. And with this, I, I captured some um, photos of a bear that it, it's a subtle effect, but it makes the image just look fundamentally different than it would otherwise with, like, the soft kind of wrapping light that actually looks like the quality of light on a cloudy day. So here, all that craziness was trying to get the light on the animal to actually be to naturally represent like the ambient light in the scene. But I'm, I'm probably getting too much in the weeds on the photography. Okay, so those are two examples of, of ideas 
that eventually led to an image. And here's another picture of a, of a grizzly bear with soft light on it. Oh, and, and then here's a picture I took of uh, um, years later of a um, especially bold um, red fox on Kodiak Island. But the thing is, you know, every once in a while one of these ideas works, works out, um, but usually they don't. And so I, there's an extremely long list of ideas that didn't work out, but one that I thought I might show just make sure I'm not too crazy over here on time. Okay. Um, is this is a this is an image of uh, um, this is Mount Jefferson in the background, and I wanted to get a picture of a mountain lion in the foreground and a moonlit volcano in the background. And I left this camera for like a couple months, never got the photo, but this so this is what a, a cougar scrape looks like, um, and I found tracks and a scrape nearby, so I just narrowly, narrowly. Um, missed this image and then I got a false trigger at night and they were doing controlled burns around the volcano. So it was this crazy like volcano shrouded in fire. It would have been the best shot of a lifetime and I didn't get it. Um, a, a question about how is the lighting control? Is it the sensor or the camera shutter? It's the, um, the camera has a little radio trigger or a wired trigger that triggers the flash at the same time the shutter goes on. So that's a good question. Um, so some shots aren't planned. Some shots aren't big ideas, but they're a reaction. So once I was hiking around, I lived in Laramie, Wyoming, and it's always windy there. It's brutal. It literally blows 50 miles per hour every week. And the only time it stops blowing is in the winter during extreme cold snaps. So it was like 20 below, I think, this day. And I was so psyched because I knew that there were gonna, it was going to be an opportunity to actually go out and see animal tracks. So I went out and... You could see most of the tracks are from last night. They had just a little bit of like dust blown in them. But then I cut this incredibly fresh cougar track. And I was, I had my friend's dog with me, but I was, I was, I was just a little spooked. You know, you just are when you sometimes see really fresh sign of a big, you know, impressive carnivore like that. So I was afraid to forward track it. So I backtracked it and I got to this ravine and then golden eagle and all these magpies flew out. And I was like, oh, there's something dead in here. And I, sure enough, I found this uh, mule deer carcass that had been cached, it had been buried in the snow by a cougar. So I went home, got a camera and set it on this carcass. Um, and then I got this picture of the mountain lion the next night. And I, I have this picture framed on my wall. It's like a 40 by 60. And I'm not sure if it's gonna traumatize kids that come over or not. Um, but um, but it, it, it was a cool insight in animal behavior too, because it, this cat, I had it so it wasn't taking images very fr frequently, so it wouldn't disturb the cat. But I, it was amazing how little progress it, it made because the carcass was frozen solid. You know, it was like 20 degrees below. Um, so then here's, I, I, I got an incredible opportunity to go to um, Kenya and help Jake Goheen uh, get images of the community ecology research he does there to um, communicate his science. And he really wanted a picture of an aardwolf or an aardvark. So this is me taking this entire action packer full of gear and setting it on a termite. Oh, so those two species, um, they eat termites and they're nocturnal. So we set up on, a, um, this is before we kind of disguised the camera, but we set up on a termite mound, hoping to get nighttime shots. So the first shot we got, I think that might be uh, the nether quarters of a cow. Um, but the first shot we, uh, we got was these cows cruising through. They went right over everything, but somehow didn't knock the gear over. Then we got the Maasai herder that was with these cows. And then, like seven minutes later, we got this pair of jackals that I think they were, um, they were probably actually working the rodents that got displaced by the group of cows. So super cool observation and this like striking um, photo. And are these raw, oh, I got a picture, are they raws or are they a bit Photoshopped? So I definitely, you know, raw images don't actually render a scene like it actually is. Like it's, they're intentionally flat. So they give you multiple, you know, as much possibility to change it. So most of these, have pretty minor editing. You know, when you're using lighting, you don't have to really like recover much usually. So most of these are just, you know, minor adjustments to like contrast and, and clarity and sharpness. Um, then at night, this crazy beast came. This is a serval. I, I taught a fish ecology class today. And, and for some reason I was talking about servals. No one in the audience knew what they were. And I didn't know what one was before I went, before I went to Kenya. So this was cool. And then we got a leopard. So this just shows like the crazy surprises that you can get. Um, and then this is my favorite surprise. We were setting for a leopard in this other spot. And we got this, I believe it's a Zorilla. It's kind of like a Kenyan skunk. 
but it just this one just made me laugh so hard because it just popped up into the frame like it really wanted to be part of the project even if it wasn't the target species and then eventually we got this picture of a leopard um and then and another thing too is since you're oftentimes doing night work and oftentimes you'll do these long exposures where you 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 light the camera you light the animal in just a, a ten thousandth of a second um just a ten thousandth of a second burst of flash is what lights the animal and then you do like a much longer exposure to bring out some of the ambient light in the background it's kind of complicated um but be, because of this you never know what it's going to look like and and because you're literally seeing the world at different temporal resolution your eyes see it so every nighttime shot you have no idea what it's going to look like and this is an example of one where there was a super moon and it rendered the night sky almost like an afternoon um you know afternoon sky so there's bad surprises too and so this is an example I, I think i showed in the title slide is when I set a uh, camera trap for endangered grevy zebras, and instead these cows tipped it over and, and broke my lens. Then I had some elephants and hyenas get into my gear, that, and, and the elephant stomped on the camera box and broke that lens in half. Um, so, so you got a, a variety of surprises. And, and then I kind of wanted, to, I know I need to start wrapping up, and I wanted to close by, um, and to me, one of the most exciting things about camera trapping is you can find, you know, you can go to places that for me are exotic and, and like, and everything's wild, like going to Kenya for the first time. But also, you can find new wonder and kind of change your relationship with more ordinary places. And so for me, I grew up in uh, Southern Oregon in the Siskiyous. And growing up, I had no interest in wildlife growing up because I didn't know there, I didn't know there was wildlife, right? I knew that I could... I knew that there were like frogs and ponds and I was into frogs, but I didn't know that there were like carnivores in the woods because you never see them, right? I, mean, I knew that there were deer, but that was about it. But when I'd visit home when I was in grad school, I'd start setting camera traps and I started photographing these animals that, again, I didn't know exist. Partly because I'm a fish squeezer, so I don't know my terrestrial species as well as I should. But this is a Pacific fisher. This is like a kind of miniature wolverine that we have in the Northwest and, and, and up in Seattle, they're trying to recover them and reintroduce them to Limbic National Park in the Southern Cascades. But it turns out the Siskiyou Mountains are one of the last strongholds for, um, for the native Pacific fisher. I didn't know that. I had no idea this mysterious beast lurked in the woods right behind my house. Um, ring I got a picture of a ringtail cat. I thought it was a possum. I thought it was like some kind of mutant possum, but it turns out it's, uh, Southern Oregon is the northern extent of the range for ringtail cat, which I always thought of like a, a desert species that lives in like Baja. And then here's a picture of a black bear that I got over uh, over the winter vacation when I was down visiting my folks. Um, so this has totally changed kind of my relationship with the woods where I grew up and also just my relationship with the woods in general, because when I go walking around now, I notice things. Like I notice um, animal sign. I'm, I'm always, I probably, blown all my chances to see a cougar in the wild because I just walk around looking at my feet looking for tracks um okay so and then not only like the woods where I grew up but now where I live I started camping out in my backyard especially when I had a newborn and I couldn't really get out much and I discovered there's a family of gray foxes living back there and um and it and, and all these fun opportunities to photograph them and even the Douglas squirrel in my backyard isn't safe from getting photographed um and then so I'm trying to kind of, one of my goals is to kind of share this, um, this kind of wonder for the woods and, 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 and making these natural places feel more alive. So share it with others. So I work with the Greenbelt Land Trust. It's one of the biggest land trusts in Oregon. And I set cameras on their properties to help them with their um, outreach and to, and to help them share with, with the people that donate to them and benefit from them to, to share all the cool wildlife that's on these properties. So, Here's a video. This is my second child, Raya, when she was just weeks old. And I take her out and set these camera traps. And I think that's me walking through some poison oak there. But here you can see this bobcat with prey coming right by where we just were. I think that's a, a cottontail in its mouth. And this is on the most popular trail, um, right on the, it's a paved trail right on the edge of Corvallis, right next to the university. There's like coyote probably sniffing my leg. And then this, so lastly, you can see See the bobcat coming back? Now look in the background. And right there, there's a jogger going by. Because it's like, it's dawn, and this is the most, you know, extremely heavily used trail, right? So you can kind of get insights into, into all the wildlife that's probably around you right now that you're just not even noticing. 
Um, okay, so I don't just use the trail cameras um, for sharing videos, also use them for uh, scouting. So here's, I figured out where this bobcat was crossing this trail um, and then got a picture of this bobcat and her two kittens um, crossing the trail. And, and, and this sharing some more photos of bobcats that I got right along this really heavily used Bald Hill Trail. Um, and then more recently, I've been photographing on a property that's now part of the, um, that's now been kind of like, um, I don't know the right verb for it, but, uh, uh, you know, had its, uh, yeah, what say? It, it's become part of the land trust, right? So now it's like deeded and, 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 and not going to be developed. But these great landowners kind of invited me to, told me about this lineage of cats that's, there's continually a group of female cats. So the mother might die, but her offspring are there, and then they'll have offspring. And I've been able to photograph them since about 2017. And so these are some of my favorite pictures that I've gotten of these cats. They're just 15 minutes from Corvallis. Um, and here's a picture of my daughter, um, helped me set a camera. And then here's a mountain lion that cruised through there a couple of days later. Um, I, do I ever use color flashes? I, I definitely use gels, uh, color gels all the time to tweak colors and make them look kind of blend into the scene. I think I used some blue and orange ones in this one. Um, so I just wanted to close by saying that if you're interested in camera trapping, I think it's, it's, I'm not trying to say it's cheap because these, you know, these things still cost money, but it's never been more affordable and more accessible in terms of things being commercially available or tons of information being available online. Um, you can even email and nag folks like me. I get emails all the time and I'm applied to people. So if you think you want to get into this, but you can buy a, a camera trap on Amazon now for 70 bucks. It actually has great image quality. Start learning about the critters in your backyard, or you can get into the fancier camera trapping. Um, you know, you can buy used gear for pretty cheap. And so I encourage everyone to, to give it a shot. And I hope that if you do, it has the same kind of transformational effect that it did on me. But I hope that you don't get red, don't go down the rabbit hole of the red fox here. Um, so I can close with that and take any questions. I just want to just have a list of, of a long list of thank yous here that, that is not comprehensive, but for a lot of the folks that have helped me along the way. And I see a question already. What ISO are you yeah. shooting and how do you decide on aperture and shutter speed? So I say, Sean, can I answer that one real quick? So, oh, I, I was just going to say, yeah, let's, thank you so much, John. Let's give Johnny a round of applause. Anybody wants to? Give him, a, give him a round of Thanks applause. Sir. Thank you. And yeah, let's let's take some time for some questions. Uh, Johnny, if you, if you don't mind, we could um, maybe stop sharing your screen. Um, and, uh, yeah. and, and then, uh, yeah. Yeah, great. Uh, let's go ahead and get into the questions. Okay, so I had um, what ISO, are, so this is like a, a photo technical question. What ISO do you use? Good question. So I use I tend to now use really high ISO, like 1600 to 3200. Um, and that makes the, that means the camera sensor is more sensitive, so you don't need as much light. And the cool thing about that is then you can have this tiny little weak flash that you can put really far away from the animal and light the scene with just a tiny little flicker of light. So that's, that's why I like using high ISO. Great. So I have, oh yeah, go ahead. Keisha, I'll, I'll hand it over to you though. Oh, no, no, it's okay. I, um, Anne, I see you have your hand up. You want to go ahead and ask your question? Yeah, thank you so much for sharing your photographies. They're so, they were very exciting. I'm a lot into photography as well, so that was uh, so cool. Um, I was just wondering about the whole process when you publish them um, in magazines such as Nature and stuff. Um, if you contact them or if they know you, so they contact you or what the whole process there is like, yeah. So um, first, like, um, you know, I don't, I'm not, I, I, I'm not like, an, I, I, I can't give you a really informed perspective on how this works just because I never really committed full on to trying to become a professional photographer. I kind of chickened out. Um, but in my own experience, um, when, what say we're trying to say we have some research come out and we're hoping to work with like a journalist to do an article then usually just in, in your communications with the journal, with the journal, they'll ask you, or with the, um, with the reporter, they'll say, hey, do you have any pictures? And it's that simple. Or if you make a press release, you can, you can with your university, you can have images be part of the press release. Um, so that's usually how that works. Um, and yeah, so I think that, that's like a succinct answer to that. 
I had like a small follow up. Do you have any favorite platforms usually to share your photography from? So this has got this, I feel embarrassed to admit this, but like now I just like Instagram, you know, so I, like and I only say because it's kind of sad because you, you take this photo that's good enough that you could print it like 40 by 60 and then people look at it on like a tiny little screen. Um, but but you can, you know, I think the Internet's shifted, right? People don't really have blogs. You don't really when you go and look at the Internet now, you don't you're not really going to people's personal websites as much anymore. And so now I feel like everything is on social media. And so, yeah, I just, when I do, yeah, I like Instagram. Instagram's good. Okay. <laughs> Thank and, you. Oh, one last thing. It's, Instagram's cool too because the social media part's really neat because I get, I routinely get messages from people in India and all over the world who are, are photographing like leopards there, maybe in, in an urban setting and asking like, hey, have you figured out a way for like to keep your flashes from running out of batteries? So the social media aspect of it is awesome because you can connect with folks all over the world. Yeah, you get to share your thoughts. Hmm. All right, thank you. Great. Uh, let's see who's next. Lucy, I think your hand's up. Yeah, hi. Um, I was just wondering because you showed so many cool photographs from like all over the country and like the world. If you had like a specific place that was like your favorite to get photos from, or maybe not so specific as a place but like ecosystem I guess to get photos from yeah you know I think my honestly I think my favorite is probably the Siskiyou Mountains where I grew up um, because there's um, there's a, a, a lot of different species you can get and and it seems and there's always I think I have an attachment to the place and I'm, I'm really interested kind of in the I like the landscape like there's these cool madrone trees and um, and Manzanita. So I just, I like the landscape and the, and the, the action's always good. And so I really like that. Um, Kenya was incredible. First, it was, it was way easier because it's so dry. You can just leave stuff out. It doesn't get rained on. You don't get like fog on your lens and stuff like that. But, but that was a place too, where if a place looks interesting, like an animal's going to show up because they're just, um, so that, that was incredible, but also incredibly difficult, too, because there's so much critter action that one, no matter what, you leave your camera for more than like 12 hours and some critter, some baboon is literally going to like grab your camera and pick up a tree um, or a hyena is going to like chew through, you know, like like the camera housing. So that was probably some of the most fun I've ever had, but also really challenging because of the frisky critters. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Uh, uh, Zina, I think you're next. Okay. Oh, hi. Thanks for uh, sharing your picture and sharing your tips. So uh, back in class, we were talking about some unethical attempts to like taking pictures such as drones or like close up photos. Um, but on the other hand, I was wondering if you witnessed any case where um, your picture or your colleagues' pictures have positively impacted the wildlife or e like or the ecosystem. Yeah, so um, I think I can address that too. I think, you know, anytime we do anything outdoors, we have some kind of impact on animals, right? And it's like the field, there's a whole field like recreational ecology, and we're learning that things like hiking have way more impact than we think. Um, and so definitely, you know, if you go place a camera in the woods and you're taking pictures of animals, like, um, you know, that animal is, is not, is noticing your camera and is responding to it. But I hope that the effects, I think the effects are really minimal in the grand scheme of things when you place the camera in the environment because you, you don't have to be there, right? So like, you know, I've seen trail cam video of like an animal, like the flash goes off and the animal like jumps back and is startled, right? But I think it's actually way less startled than an animal gets if it, if it smells a human or if it hears a human voice like on a trail. So I generally think the impacts are pretty small. But one thing that I, that I try to do is set on lines rather than points. I'm probably going into my scale, but what I mean by that is like a line is something like a trail, right? Or, or a, um, if it's, a, if it's an, like an area where an animal's drinking, it's like a pool in an entire stream. So, whereas like a point is something like a den um, or like a single water hole that an animal can drink at, or if for some reason you disturb them at that site, like they don't have, it, it's, it's like a, um, 
they lose that one point that might be really important. Does that make sense? If that makes sense. Um, and, and sometimes I do see photos, like camera trap photos that I worry a little bit about now, like see people like setting camera traps at like wildlife crossings under, uh, under freeways and stuff, which is really important for communicating like the importance of those things. But you don't want to like necessarily, you don't want to like inadvertently like spook an animal at a critical point like that and mess with it. So anyway, so that's my concerns about ethical stuff. And then in terms of benefits, um, I think probably the, the, the um, there's two things that I, that I feel that I'm proud about. One is I think I've introduced the Pacific Fisher to probably like thousands of people through, through my photos. And most of them didn't know what a Pacific Fisher was. And it's a, it's a species that's a candidate for listing by the Fish and, Wild, Fish and Wildlife Service that probably should be listed, but that they say like there, there are enough resources, it's not a priority species. And that reflects the fact that we don't care enough about it. So I, I feel like I'm, I'm making impact that way. And then also, um, I, I'm totally to my own horn, horn here, but I was volunteer of the year for the Greenbelt Land Trust. So I feel like, um, so that, that was like a, a, that's like the only award I've ever really won. And uh, in, in terms of the, anyways, I was super psyched about that. And, and I feel like that I'm helping them do their work, which I think is really important. So, so those are ways I feel like I've had positive impacts that offset the fact that I definitely spooked some critters especially coyotes. Um, but, but I think hopefully on the whole, it's had a positive impact. Yeah. Thank you for that, uh, John. And just, I mean, I know that volunteer of the year, that's a great award, but you also won uh, photograph of the year uh, recently, didn't you? I had, I had, a com I was extremely honored. I had a commended, a highly commended image in the um, natural history contest. So um, I, I definitely didn't win it, but I got highly commended, which, which is a huge honor. Yeah. Great. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, well, let me know. I see your hand is up. Oh, yeah. All right, let me move it down here. Um, uh, I was wondering, like, um, how do you, like, sort the photos? Like, do you take, like, since it seems like you have like a lot all over the place, like do you have to sort them yourself or do you have someone look at them or like a computer? I, I, I know they're kind of working on that. That's a great question that, that makes me feel a little bit of anxiety because I have 10 gazillion, I'm terrible at editing. It's like my email inbox. You know, at some point you just stop deleting. You're like, it's, it's, it's like pointless, you know? And so your so my email inbox is like ten gazillion emails, and same with my photos. Like, I'm really bad at editing them and organizing them. They're not back. They're backed up a little bit, but not as well as they should be. And it's like, um, you know, like when people used to keep all their like important documents in like shoe boxes, and they knew exactly what shoe box it, it's in. That's how I am with my photos, kind of. So I, I do a bad job at it, and and that's that's one aspect in which I'm definitely not a professional photographer. <laughs> so it sounds like you need an assistant. That'd be cool. <laughs> All right. Ava, I see your hand up. Hi, thank you, um, Johnny, for both staring your story in general and also just really showing some captivating images. Um, I wanted to ask because I noticed that a lot of your publications were based off of salmon populations, and I'm a really big salmon person as well. Um, are you thinking of at some point incorporating more of your imagery to more aquatic species or maybe even putting them in your publications? Because with environmental communication in general, um, there's a lot of methods that uh, are becoming more prevalent to make things both easy to translate and accessible for people. So would that be helpful regarding what you're continuing to do both in your research and within your hobbies? Yeah, so that, that's a really good question. And actually, probably my most used photograph I've ever taken is an underwater shot of salmon. And, um, and it's, it's a bunch of sockeye salmon with an Arctic char underneath them. And so that at the same time, so my other kind of passion in, in photography was underwater photography. And I, and I love it. And it's um, for kind of the same reasons I like camera trapping. But then right after I started, right after I moved to Oregon, I started this job, uh, Jason Ching and I went down to photograph spawning red band trout in the Klamath Basin in the winter. It was really cool. It was like snowing. We were, we were photographing these fish. 
and my lens port popped off and I flooded my camera. And, uh, and it was just like, it was one of those things where I was running out. Underwater photography takes a ton of time. Like Jason Ching is incredible. Like he goes out and just, you know, spends like all day, like waiting for, you know, this fish to appear. And, and I just don't have that kind of time anymore. I can, I can, the cool thing for, I know I'm giving a super long way to answer, but I can take, I can take my kiddos with me and I can go set a camera. It's kind of, I make it sound like I'm a good parent. No, I, I give them a tablet and I have them watch how to train your dragon for like two hours. So I'm not like parent of the year in any way, but I can go do that. And then I can, um, so I can set cameras with them. I can check cameras with them and I can do that without having a lot of time. Whereas like for me, underwater photography, just, I don't have the time for it. And I flooded my, my camera, but I wish I did because I think it's, um, it's, 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 yeah, it's so much fun. And now, especially with, um, there's more technology for like remotely triggering cameras and getting creative images. So I wish I was still doing it. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Great. Uh, and I see, uh, Tanya, you had your question, your hand up. Yeah, I was, I guess my question is more for fun, but I was kind of curious if I know you can get a lot of maybe bad images of yourself or other participants while taking uh, camera trap photos. Do you keep a secret file of that of just like awful photos of people that have worked with you or are those instant deletes? You know, I'm not, I would, I'm not above doing that, but I'm not organized enough to like keep them. Um, but I wish I had to share. Um, so Jason, Shing and I, when we were first, we set a camera somewhere around like, um, somewhere northeast of Seattle and when I was in grad school on this timberland and we got like a bunch of rodents and a skunk and it was like one of the few times that we got a coyote and that was when we were first figuring out how to use Photoshop and when we checked the camera we posed for it so we both squat down next to each other and then we, photo we, we stacked all the images together in Photoshop so it was me and him like squatting down with the light on us and then the coyote somehow was perfectly in between us then there was like a skunk and all the like uh, all the rodents, and it was one of my favorite shots. So I should have shared it. That's the best kind of the best example I have of, um, of of using like the outtakes in a creative way. That's awesome. That's awesome. I uh, I'm realizing that it is five thirty, and so uh, before we say before we uh, start the stop the um, YouTube stream. Johnny, I'm just wondering if you have, just because you seem really innovative in your use of camera traps and thinking about conservation photography in this way, what do you think then, what, what is the next frontier in, in, um, in conservation photography? What do you think is coming next? That's, okay, so one, and a kind of an easy answer is that um, the sensor technology is coming to the point I think there's a new movie that just dropped in like Disney about like nights, the wild nights. And there's that Netflix one. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so like, I really like the, I really like the challenge of lighting natural scenes, but now it's getting to the point where you don't even need to light natural scenes. Like, because the sensor technology is like literally allowing you to see at night. Especially if there's like a little bit of moon or something. So I think that's one area that's going to transform, um, you know, like the, the ways that we can see the world. Um, and I, I, I don't understand like virtual reality, but I assume that's, that, you know, that's going to, that's going to be play a role and, and like maybe, you know, the webcam, you know, webcams are pretty amazing. Right. Um, I know that half the time I'm at work, I'm checking the surf cam, you know, and I can be like at three different beaches at once. Right. And so I, I think that, uh, webcams could be a really cool way for people to, um, you know, is that, is it at Cornell that has like the Osprey cam mm -hmm. and like the nest cams and stuff. So I think that could be a really cool way to, um, to let people, you know, kind of like take a little like uh, micro dose of nature without having to, um, you know, go travel somewhere. Yeah. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for that, uh, Johnny. We really do appreciate you joining us today. Um, I just want to say thank you to everyone who's joining us online. And I'm going to go ahead and in the YouTube stream, please join us again next week for our next edition of the conversation.